All right. Yeah. Good All afternoon, right. ladies and gentlemen. Clapping. That's great. Welcome to the West Michigan Strategic Alliance State of the Region. I am Rick Truer. And I'm Todd Herring. And uh, we are with River City Improv. Mm -hmm. And to get things started, we're going to do a brief demonstration for you. But in order for this demonstration to be successful, we are going to need a couple volunteers to come up on stage and help us. Two people. Two people. Who are willing to help add it all up. And I, I saw a hand raised right there. And another one right here. Come on right. up. Perfect. That was easy enough. Oh, a big round of applause for our volunteers. And we thought that was going to be hard. We I thought know. it was like, oh, I've got my suit on. I don't want to get... I was going to start naming names. but So we have Linda. Hello, Linda. Thank you. And Jerry. What's Hi, Linda. How are you? Oh, you Bye know, just going to do a little improv you. here. So. She tells me we've been on stage before. Yeah. Yeah, your face looks a little familiar to me. So, Oh, the two of you have been on stage together. It's cute. Oh, it's like an encore presentation. This was meant to be. Okay, well, let's move over to this area of the stage where we have a little more room. So uh, what's going to happen here is Todd and I are going to start Linda. acting out a scene. Uh, the problem is that we will not be able to move our bodies of our own volition. Mm -mm. So not we need Jerry and Linda to do this for us. So, you know, Todd might be saying something like, Hey, Rick, pass me the football. Here, right here, I'll catch it with one hand, I swear, okay? You know, and then if you need him to walk, you know, you can just pull on his knees here, that type of thing, so... Oh, it just missed me and hit that car. We'll be able to talk, and um, you can listen to the commands that we're giving, or just, you know, decide to move us in a completely different uh, way, and or hopefully not into these nice people right here, right. sitting right in front of us, but... It's a danger right. zone. <laughs> to get things started, I need... Um, some type of task that you would do in the workplace. Yeah. Getting the coffee. Getting the coffee. Making Getting the coffee. Perfect. Making the coffee. All righty. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay. Here we go. Oh, oh sorry about that. Sure, that's perfect. Just Rick, as long it's 8.35 in the morning. 8.35. Oh, sure okay, enough. I'm freaking out. Yep. Well, Look at me. I've got the jitters and everything. I can't see it, Todd. I'm, I'm sorry. I just can't. Oh, there you are. Well, you know, Todd, I could, I could make some coffee here. Please, please, man. It's five minutes late. All right. I'm just going to scoop all the grounds right in there. We're just going to use my hand. I'm sure you won't mind. I don't mind at all. So at all. I can do it without looking, too. Right. That's the amazing thing. Oh, there it is. Hey, I'm going to fill the craft with water. I'm coming. All right, great. Well, here, um, I got... <laughs> I'll get there. Whoops, I just spilled a little bit. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. What time is our first meeting? Oh, probably not till nine. There you go. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay. Here, um. <laughs> hey. Danger. Yeah. <laughs> Real props. <laughs> yeah. Uh-oh. Wow. They're getting, I'm, I'm feeling so wide awake now. I can't believe it. I forgot where the water cooler is. Yeah, oh, I'm, oh, I'm drinking my coffee already. I already have it made. Wow, that's, that's that's not good, man. You should just wait for the coffee. It's, Don't eat grounds. It's Sanka. The it's last Sanka. time you did that, we approved three million dollars. I know. I felt great afterwards, though. For Nerf balls, man. <laughs> but it did improve morale. It did. It did. Absolutely. So, well, here's to employee morale. Here's to employee morale. Cheers. I'm a more Nerf balls. Oh, man. Oh. See you later. Oh. Perfect. All right. That was good. Thank you very much, Jerry, amazing. Linda. Uh, Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. Sorry about the next screen. Oh, it's, it's, it's all right. I've got insurance. All right. <laughs> Well, anyway, that was just a brief demonstration for you, and uh, one of the things we wanted to point out is um, how awkward it is if someone is moving you the entire time, and if you're not motivated yourself to get things going and to move yourself in the right direction. That's right. It's not all fun and games, per se. I mean, I'm sure many of you have had to micromanage somebody simply because they weren't moving themselves, and today we're talking about bringing talent to the area, talent that's going to take advantage of the opportunity that West Michigan can provide, and if they're not passionate and motivated to do so, what you end up having is a scene like similar to what yes. you just saw. To be able to see what needs to be done and to go ahead and do it. So enjoy. It all adds up and hope you appreciate the state of the region. Thanks for having Thanks. us. Wow, we are overwhelmed by the great participation today. 
And what about River City Improv? What a fantastic job. Kind of, kind of reminds me a little bit of regionalism. To talking to Rick before, before they did the routine, he said, we just make it up as we go. And I think uh, we do that quite a bit in regionalism as well. Guys have obvious talent. We really thank them for uh, sharing their talents with us today. Well, look at all of you. We are totally amazed and gratified at this great participation today. You, the audience, is a demonstration of the collaborative spirit that is alive and well in making West Michigan the best place to live, work, and play. It's great to see people here from all four corners of our region. Regional collaboration works because we have the broad representation. WIMS's mission is to be a catalyst for regional collaboration. In that regard, I would uh, ask my fellow board members to stand and be recognized. Stand up. <laughs> they, like you, are willing to put forth personal effort on behalf of our great region. I'd like, too, to personally thank George Bosnack, Sue Higgins, and Pat Olt, who finished their terms in 2007. It is with regret that we also report resignations from Bill Lowry and Phil Barnes. We are pleased to announce recent additions to the board of Cindy Larson from the Muskegon Area Chamber of Commerce and Bob Gerritsen uh, from Waddell and Reed. We're fortunate to have these board members who share a common desire and commitment to improve our region, especially at this time when we are facing some major challenges. As you'll see in the vital signs, we have much to be concerned about and also much to be happy about. In the next two hours, we'll share with you some updates on the vital signs, WIMS's regional initiatives, and then focus our attention on the critical issue of talent. We are fortunate to have with us today Dick Ferguson, who's the CEO and Chairman of the Board of ACT, and a number of distinguished guests. They include representatives from the state, counties, cities, townships, and other local officials, folks from businesses and nonprofits throughout the region, as well as representatives from our educational, philanthropic, and healthcare institutions. We also want to welcome the folks who are here from outside our region. The challenges we face in West Michigan are not unique to us alone. The whole state is dealing with many of the same issues. We're happy to see Phil Powers from the center of Michigan here, again, who spoke last year about Michigan's defining moment. We are working with Phil and others to link up and make a difference across the state. It all adds up. Thanks to our sponsors, regional leaders, Grand Rapids Community College, ACT and Keytrain, Regional Stewards, Consumers Energy, Magna Donnelly, Energy Options and Solutions, and also our regional supporters, Progressive AE and Pallets Business Supplies. Thank you also to the volunteers from Campfire USA AmeriCorps who helped with registration. Today's presentation focuses on talent. During the course of the program, we'll show you how West Michigan is responding to attracting, retaining, and growing talent in the region. Its talent will keep our manufacturing base strong, productive, and competitive in the future. It's talent that will convert ideas to new products and services. Putting talented minds to work in our region will drive the success of our economy. There are many people and organizations focused on this issue throughout West Michigan. Today we'll share some of what WIMSA and our partners are doing to impact talent in the region. Thank you for taking time to participate in our State of the Region event today. Your participation certainly does add up. It's my pleasure at this time to introduce Greg Northrop, President of WIMSA. Thank you, Al. God, is this great. We only have a few opportunities in life to uh, try to help make a difference, and each of you are here today 
to help us make that difference. And it's, it's uh, so rewarding to me and the team of people that work on your behalf at WIMSA and all of the other organizations that we're part of. It's just a great day. Uh, so I, let me add my own wow factor to what Al said. Um, this is the great times in life, and so I look forward to talking to you over the next couple hours about some of the things that are going on. Last year, i got to make sure. Last year I, I said to you, uh, as we introduced the vital science to you, that our commitment would be to annually update the region as to how we're doing as it relates to the vital science and how we measure quality of life for our region. Uh, as part of that commitment, we also committed to taking action uh, to improve the region's performance or quality of life. And so it's not just having data that we would look at, but in fact data that helps us to understand what the critical issues are, what the priorities are for us, and how to best allocate our resources against those sets of priorities. If you're interested in uh, seeing more detail about the vital signs and the update that we'll talk about this year, you can go to our website uh, and it will be produced there tomorrow uh, in detailed form. In 2007, oops, sorry about that. Uh, in 2007, with the help of many folks around the region, we published the first vital signs for our re report. It offered clear, tangible standards by which we could measure sustainability and quality of life in our region. Many of you participated in the development of the vital signs last year. As I travel around the region, it's become quite clear that there's a strong recognition of the need and the benefits of accountability as a way to help us deal with scarce resources. Uh, and as we deal with issues of world energy crisis and those kinds of things, it'll become more and more incumbent upon us to make better decisions using better data. So I'm convinced we're on the right track in terms of where it is that we're trying to go. And as I talk to business leaders, about the work of West Michigan, uh, it's clear in terms of the responses that they get that they see now that we understand what it is we need to do and we're doing a better job uh, reporting back to them and achieving accountability in the work that we're trying to do. And for that, we will start to see better participation and support and investment uh, in the work of the region. So I'm very encouraged by it. Unfortunately, we do need better data to make better decisions. Uh, and I'll talk about that process. But the good news is uh, 5,700 people decided to go to our website over the course of the last eight months and download this data. Uh, I take that as a sign to say that, in fact, people are interested in the data. They're trying to help uh, themselves understand how it might be used in their own organization and their own process. And the best thing that WIMSA can do is to make the data available to you to help you maybe act on things that are important to you as it relates to sets of issues that we're trying to deal with in our region. Last year, we did learn that there were gaps in the data and some important things couldn't be measured like uh, water quality, land use, energy, and diversity. And in addition to improving access to data, we decided we need to set goals. <clears throat> From this year's data, you'll see that there's room for improvement. We realize that we need to understand and establish trends and benchmarks across the country and in other regions. Uh, sync here. Uh, this year, we're opting to publish the data on the website as opposed to publishing it in hard copy. Uh, there's not much change in some of the areas, and so it didn't make sense to publish a more detailed report, uh, but it's available electronically to you. Where possible, we try to trend the data over five years. We had hoped that the contrast, be able to contrast many of the measures of last year's data uh, to this year's data, but due to changes in sampling population and apples and oranges kinds of comparisons, uh, we're ending up with just a one-year snapshot in some cases. And I tried to push the envelope with my technical team, but they said, don't go there. And so I accept the advice of good people like uh, George Erichek and others that advise us on how do we actually use this data. In your packets, you'll find something called at a glance. Uh, and there you can look at the 15 indicators of regional performance as we measure them. I'll run through these quickly, uh, talk about what's happening from our perspective uh, and what we might uh, do about that. Uh, we've divided them up, if you recall, last year into economic, social, and environmental sets of data. And the economic indicators we look at are per capita income, employment rate, self-employed professionals, and free and reduced price lunches. On a per capita basis, this year's data are, uh, we're at $30,497. We're less than the Michigan average, and we're less than the U.S. average. 
And on a trend basis, while we continue to track what's going on uh, at both the Michigan level and the U.S. level, we still are lagging behind uh, those other locations. And in terms of employment rate, um, this shows the highest employment rate suggested that fewer working age adults have been forced to resign from the area's workforce. In short, individuals quit, working, quit looking for work or can't find work because their skills are inadequate or because they face other barriers to work. This is less the case, though, in West Michigan. And in fact, what the chart shows is that we have a higher propensity to work here because of our work ethic as a part of the West Michigan commitment to that process. In the area of self-employed professionals, 2006, um, I'm sorry, in the area of uh, free and reduced price lunches, you'll see that we're slightly above the average uh, for the rest of the state, and uh, this continues to be of some concern to us. In the environmental integrity area, uh, the two that you see in red, recycling activity and land use changes, we do not have data for those, and I'll talk about uh, the gap there that we're trying to deal with uh, shortly. But with regard to closed beach days, and uh, toxic release, we do have information to report. The good news for us is that we added two additional beaches that we measure the closings for, and we had 56 fewer closed beach days. Unfortunately, we still had 579 days where our beaches were closed. And for a place to be a best place to live, work, learn, and play, I don't think this is what we want to say about our region or about what our, our issues are relative to our ability to support tourism. And so it's something we need to continue to focus in on. With regard to toxic release inventory, uh, West Michigan experienced substantial decreases in toxic releases over the last seven years. Uh, and we continue to show good progress on a trending basis with regard to what we're doing both on-site and off-site toxic release. And so it's a strong uh, suggestion of change for us in the right direction. There are also social justice indicators that we measure. Uh, these include income by race and ethnicity, voter participation, no health care coverage, crime rate, teens not in school, and housing cost burden. And I think I skipped, oh, I'm going backwards, I'm sorry. With regard to income by race and ethnicity, of continuing concern in 2006 is the gap in income between white households and black and Hispanic households has widened. Uh, and when you see this data, it'll be easier to read in terms of the actual chart. Uh, but where you, what you see there at the top is the total, and then as you work your way down, it's the white population, the black and Hispanic population, and the gap is of great concern to us as we continue to deal with this issue. With regard to voter participation, 59% of the registered voted, voters in West Michigan voted in 2006 election, putting us ahead of the rest of the state. With regard to health care coverage, the number of people in West Michigan without health care coverage continues to rise. I suspect that this is not a surprise relative to some of the economic issues we're dealing with, but it should be of great concern to us as an issue for our population. The good news on crime rate is that uh, we show improvement, and it's the lowest it's been since 2000 uh, with regard to crime. And then on, on uh, property crime, rates have also uh, decreased with a slight increase in this year, but compared to the state, we're still doing better. Teens not in school. In 2006, West Michigan's percentage of teens not in school was lower that, than that of the state average in the U.S. as a total. And with regard to housing cost burden, more than one in three households in West Michigan uh, have housing cost burden, as it might be defined. We're better off than the state, and we're better off than the U.S. slightly. The question I think we should ask ourselves as we go forward is, do we want to be just better than the U.S. average? Do we want to be just better than the Michigan average, or do we want to set a pace for ourselves that actually challenges ourselves, and we want to be best practices as it relates to quality of life? And so as we look at this data over the long term, it's not that we want to be better than the average. It's, want to, it's, it's that we want to be a best place to live, work, and play, which means we need to set some higher standards for ourselves in terms of where we're trying to go. Tough challenges, but things that we need to face up to. With regard to the information I just covered, at the detail level, at the county level, all of the data, as I said, will be posted onto our website. So if you're interested in county level data, go to the website and you can pull off the data. For those of you that are keeping track, you'll notice that I skipped educational attainment, and I'll come back to this later in the program. We are improving our ability to understand the quality of life in our region. 
but there is still work to be done to identify the data that better supports our ability to prioritize and focus resources. WMSA continues and plans to update and issue revised ports on an annual basis. With the help of our partners, Grand Valley State University's Community Research Institute and the Annis Water Resource Institute, the WEF John Institute for Employment Research and Delta Strategies, we plan to enhance or modify data used in 2006 and 7 and add benchmarking with 10 comparable regions published in hard copy in 2009. We plan to publish plans for gathering data that are unique to West Michigan to be collected in areas of land use, energy, water quality, and diversity by April of 2009. And we plan to begin to provide unique local data gathering as funding permits to include data in hard copy versions in April of 2010. It's interesting to me when I first came here uh, and I said, what is our most important asset? As I talk to people, and typically people say water quality or water as it relates to our, our lakes and our rivers. And we don't have an indicator that says to us, this is what the quality of water is in West Michigan. And for something that's such a critical resource uh, for us, it's something we need to figure out how to measure and track so that in fact we can understand what the issues are. At a local level, a lot of this is going on, but we don't have data at a regional level and it's a good example of the kind of thing that we should better understand about ourselves. We will continue to maintain data on our website, uh, and uh, please go to the website if you're interested in this work. I would like to recognize the Steelcase Foundation for their leadership with the generous gift that they just gave us to support this project. We have no regional governance structure, and this is why in many cases we do not have regional data. Strong support from Steelcase gives us the opportunity to better understand how our quality of life is being affected, and many thanks to their team. We're approaching other potential investors that we think will support this effort as well. I'm just not in a position to announce those investment uh, support decisions at this point in time, but look forward to us providing much better data and much better understanding about what are the issues that we need to deal with as a region. Last year, uh, when we did a voting process, if you all recall, we had uh, the electronic devices that are in front of you today. We did a pair-to-pair pair pair comparison against each of the indicators that we've just covered. 47% of that audience said the most important issue for this region, or one with the greatest relevance, was educational attainment as measured by the number of 25 to 34-year-olds with BA degrees or higher. And that's, that's to suggest that we're not interested in people with other types of technical degrees, but it's a way to understand what our capability was. Today's event, we will focus on the work that's underway to increase our educational performance. More on that shortly. But clearly, the need for educated workers in West Michigan is holding our economy back. I can tell you this till I'm blue in the face. But let's see what some West Michigan employers are saying about how they deal with this issue. Our state and our region really is at a crossroads. Gone is the day where someone would go into a manufacturing company or a foundry and uh, start working there right out of high school and uh, be there for 30 or 40 years as long as uh, they could stay into the workforce. We've had uh, significant losses in jobs in a variety of, of sectors. We really need to focus on what are specific things that we can do to turn this around because uh, more of the same is not going to uh, fix the problem. Well, twice a year I do a technology forecast and I can tell you that in the last two years it's been over 30 percent meaning the companies that we've spoken to 30 percent of those firms indicate that they're going to be increasing their IT staff. I feel like the West Michigan area is is poised for the knowledge economy. There are a lot of businesses in the area that can certainly use individuals with technical training as well as experience in specific areas. In the very near future there's going to be a high demand for skilled people in the healthcare industry. And as we look into the, the growth of uh, healthcare and how it changes and how you have to stay competitive, you have to stay cutting edge. In order that, you need to have a technical skill. But a lot of people don't, don't know that doctors and nurses only make up 60% of healthcare. So we need to have people that can not only install, repair, and work on that equipment, that, but can operate it. But in order to be at that point, we have to be able to, to say we're technically skilled and we can learn on the fly and learn on the go as the technology comes out, we're ready to keep up with it.
I think the reason for, for growth in the technology field is, is that it continues to enhance a company's ability to be more productive. Manufacturing seems to have gotten a bad name. We've reduced the amount of, of actual manual labor that goes on and we've increased the dependence on sophisticated manufacturing techniques. And the technicians who are managing that equipment have to be smart and agile and able to make decisions quickly. In our business, it's all about innovation and creativity. Product changes every day. Uh, new stuff happens every day. The difference is talent. The difference is do you have a team that's going to be creating the next thing that's going to be the next big thing. And to find people that are technically able to operate in that environment, be great problem solvers, be great team workers, is very different than the way that it was 20 years ago. I think if you look at our unemployment rate and some of those positions that are going unfilled right now is because there are a shortage of people to fill those positions because they don't have the technical skill. However, there is a way to help that and that's where we need to step up to the plate. Things are tough and, and times like this really require uh, action from groups like uh, the Strategic Alliance. And it takes a conjoined effort. It takes the effort of government. It takes the effort of schools. It takes the effort of individuals, business, industry, healthcare. All of us have to work together to make sure that we provide the viable things that the community needs to stay attractive uh, and to stay um, um, ahead of the economy. I think as a community we have opportunities to attract more Gentex uh, type companies to West Michigan. It's going to take having a workforce uh, of skilled people at at the ready, available, that, that we can build our business. That's a question for us long term. Will the rest of the community keep up and be able to support us as we compete globally? This is a new day. This is a new game. We can't keep doing things the same way and expect Michigan to come back. When someone sees West Michigan and what it has to offer, we can help retain that, that talent. It's really just getting the word out there and, and being able to make people aware that we have these kinds of opportunities available. It doesn't really matter whether you're making a plastic part in Shanghai or Mexico City or Grand Rapids, Michigan. Give me the people who can run the machines and I have no problem with competition. I think as uh, hopefully all of you concluded that the challenge is real, uh, the good news is it's not insurmountable and in fact there's a lot of work underway to affect educational attainment being done by not only the WMSA but many other organizations across our region. I want to thank Bruce, Haig and Ken and Beth for taking time out of the busy schedule to help us with that uh, video. I see some real talent there. Uh, maybe we can take advantage of the new film industry tax. Uh, no surprise to you, and um, for the four of you, the good news is I'm sending the CD to Clint Eastwood, who just announced that he's making a new mo movie in West Michigan uh, sometime later this year. And I heard that they need some extras, so good luck to you guys. But seriously, this does help to set the focus for today on talent. Consistent with our practice, though, of helping us better understand who attends the events like this, uh, that we put together. We're going to have you grab your keypads uh, and give Van Brenda Vandermeulen of River Hills Consulting some information. Brenda, Brenda, are we ready to roll? not been my day. <laughs> okay, they're not going to, but hopefully this will get turned on. Okay, all right. 
I have to hand it off to somebody else, so at some point it has to come on. We'd like to start by asking some questions about you. You're going to grab that keypad in front of you to do that. And I'm going to put a series of questions up. There'll be numbers alongside them. And if you would just vote the number that represents you the best. In some cases, uh, you may say, well, gee, maybe I fit in two of those groups, not too many of them. Um, pick the one that's the best. And uh, I reminded myself earlier today, if you push a number that's not in the choices, your keypad won't register. So uh, thankfully, I didn't call tech support before I figured out that I was pushing the wrong number. You can press the clear button and get the same result. So here we go. In which type of organization do you work? If it's an educational institution, vote a one. A business for profit, vote a two. Local or state government, a three. Nonprofit public sector, other than education, a four. Private citizen, a five, or whatever else you want to do. You'll notice on the right that there's a, a bar going down. That tells you how many seconds you have left to vote. And we got 398 people in on that one. That's pretty good. Which of the following best describes your role with the organization? And I think there's more than 398 people here, so let's see if we can get that number up. Well, a little bit. What is your age group? There is only one right answer for each of you. <laughs> yes, uh, to the gentleman in the front, you can lie. <laughs> but nobody will know what you pushed anyway, so. <laughs> and it's not what age group would you like to be part of? Again, only one right answer. What is your gender? And if you need more time, ask the person next to you. If we get to 401, I'll go ahead and move it along. Some of you are thinking. How do you describe your race and ethnicity? Where do you live? And you're going to see a different map come up right away real fast <laughs> on two of the screens so that we can see the areas. Either that or I'm going to stop it from voting for a minute here. Um, do we have maps? There we go. The maps are on the side screens. Grand Rapids is six, Holland is seven, Muskegon is the two, Grand Haven area is five, Lansing looks like it must be four, the east. That's for living. This is for learning. Where do you learn? And hopefully you'll all say you learn someplace. Where do you work or volunteer? And these are kind of primarily. You might have a home office 
um, but you travel around a lot. Well, where's your home office then? Where's the primary place that you work? And where do you play? This is the hardest one to pick one on, isn't it? We decided you could always think about where do you like to play the best or the most. What's your favorite place to play? And then your last question is, do you consider yourself to be a decision maker or policy influencer within your organization or your scope of influence? Yeah. I always find this a really fun question to debrief. Okay, here's what we've got. We've got a lot of business people here, um, some educators and nonprofits, government and citizens. And I honestly, I think that might look a little different than last year. It'll be interesting to see when we get the um, comparison to last year. Most of you are leaders or staff members in your organizations. Um, you're all in my, or many of you are in my age group. And, and, and a number of you are younger, which I think also might be uh, new from last year. Pretty evenly divided between men and women, uh, primarily Caucasian. Area 6, Grand Rapids, I think, is Area 6. And uh, that's the primary area. And Area 7, I think, might be the Holland area, is the second one. Okay, 48% of you live in Grand Rapids. 54% of you learn there. 52% of you work there. Ha ha, but you play other places. And most of you are decision makers or policy influencers within your organization. Thanks very much. And uh, we will turn it over, I believe, to Jeff at this point. Thank you, Brenda. This is the, I'm Jeff Abahar. I'm the uh, clerk of Park Township, and uh, welcome today. This is the part of the program where we tell you a little bit about the work of the Strategic Alliance over the last year. Since our beginning in 2000, the Strategic Alliance has carried forward the mission to be a catalyst for regional collaboration. In seven years' time, we've seen a real growth and development of the West Michigan regional mindset. 1,093 unique individuals devoted, the more, devoted more than 6,692 hours to the Strategic Alliance meetings and events. More than 250 organizations are participating in the Strategic Alliance directed regional initiatives, either actively through our collaborative partnership model as a support of one of our current wired innovations, or less formally by sharing information or ensuring our websites are linked, improving our regional communications. You've already heard from Greg about the Regional Indicators Initiative. Let me introduce you to a few folks to update you on some of the work of the Strategic Alliance this past year. More information on these initiatives are in some of the packets that you have at your table. Sustainable Manufacturing, the Sustainable Manufacturing Initiative published an alternative energy cluster analysis this year. Let's hear it for Gary Smith, who's going to, from 2K Tool, who found it to be useful. Where's Gary? based on the overall uplifting tooling industry. As we began the research, 
came across the alternative energy <laughs> cluster analysis report on the West Michigan Strategic Alliance website. As we, after reading the report several times, it became clear to us that this was a new and emerging industry that would require a large manufacturing base and a highly skilled workforce to produce high quality parts. A perfect fit for Mich Michigan manufacturers. It also became clear that the new industry would address the environmental concerns as well as the shortage of available energy. We then contacted Greg Northrup of West Michigan Strategic Alliance Group and after some discussions on the report and what we were looking to accomplish, Greg put us in touch with Ann Sailors of The Right Place. A tour of the Grand Valley State Michigan Renewable Energy Center located in Muskegon was arranged to show some of the research and development being done in the alternative energy sector. Ann then put us in contact with Dan Radonsky of the Next Energy Group whose charter is to advance the alternative energy industry in Michigan. Working with Dan, we have attended three events, had discussions with other companies involved in the industry, and have become a member of the work group that receives monthly updates in regards to companies looking for help in development and manufacturing of new products. We also have been placed on the Michigan Directory of Alternative Energy Suppliers to receive RFQs and invitations to supplier events. In closing, we would like to thank all the people involved with West Michigan Strategic Alliance, The Right Place, and Next Energy for all the help and support we received throughout this process. Thank you. Next, we're going to we're going to hear a little bit later for, about Work Keys Innovation from Dick Ferguson. From, but right now, here is J.P. Sipneski from Axios Incorporated. J.P., where are you? Right here. Right here. Hi. Hey there, I am. Up there too. Well, on behalf of Axios Incorporated, we want to thank everyone for inviting us to speak at this event. For those that might not be familiar with Axios Incorporated, we're a locally owned and operated organization providing outsourcing, human resource outsourcing, to many West Michigan businesses. Some divisions of that you may be familiar with are staffing incorporated, office staffing, and we also have our human resource services. Our involvement has been with the Wired Work Keys Initiative for about the past year and a half. We've worked closely with their team to help educate the local business community on the benefits of the Career Readiness Certificate. Our efforts have been targeted towards the transitional and incumbent workforces with the end goal of creating greater employee and employer awareness. In West Michigan, we are experiencing firsthand the evolution of employment from manual labor to a knowledge-based workforce. Although many people have the potential to increase their knowledge, Few possess the necessary skills, abilities, and intangibles to complete the jobs of tomorrow. Prior to the introduction of Work Keys, there has not been a universal platform in which we could determine our employees' cognitive abilities. By instituting Work Keys across the region, we believe that we can build a stronger and smarter workforce and become, more, become a more attractive uh, target for outside businesses. Taking the first steps in implementing the Work Keys program in our organization was relatively painless. We tested all of our internal executive staff in, in order to understand what areas we were strong or weak in. Once the results were tallied, we, enabled, we were enabled to develop an employee-specific training program focused on improving each employee-specific area of weakness. This investment in our staff members enables us to retain top talent and keep their knowledge within the organization. After realizing the benefits of this testing, we turned our attentions to our temporary workforce. We began pre-testing all of our temporary employees to get a better feel of their cognitive abilities. Although this testing does not earn a candidate an official career readiness certificate, it enables us to increase our selection and matching accuracy by pairing the employee's scores with our customers' occupational profiles. Beyond placement, the employees can come to any of our field offices to further prepare themselves for the actual CRC test. 
We offer online modules that will help them focus in areas in which they need further practice. In our experience, we believe the advantages of participating in this initiative far outweigh the disadvantages. It can help you in matching the best and most qualified employees uh, for your specific positions, creating an employment development plan that improves retention and rewards your employees based on their professional accomplishments and attracting new business opportunities and employment to the West Michigan market. New business drives economic stimulus. On the broader scale, participation in this program is the socially conscious, socially responsible thing to do. At the business to business level, participation can be a lasting investment in your current and future workforces. We strongly encourage every business to participate in this, in this initiative by signing a letter of commitment. In this letter, they ask you to commit to these basic topics. First, they ask you to ask all your new incoming employees for their career readiness certificate and recognize that as uh, a credential to be hired. And they also ask for your participation and advocacy. By adding your company's name to the growing list of committed employers, you position yourself as an innovator and a supporter of progress in West Michigan. This is a grassroots initiative that cannot take off without your help. Thank you for your time. Thank you, JP. <laughs> Innovation Works, launched by The Right Place, and its economic development partners introduced a website designed to mine innovations and new technologies, connect companies and individuals to resources, and coach them through the commercialization process. Here's Orville Crane, president of Muskegon's Inventors Network. Orville, where are you? It's on? All right. It, it's on. Good. Hello, everybody. It's nice to be here. My name is Orville Crane, and I'm an inventor. My partners and I invented this. It's a widget. It's just a little box and package opening tool that won't cut you. We, we um, invented it, patented it, trademarked it, and it's made not only in the United States, but it's made right here in West Michigan. We've sold one million of these little babies. How's that, huh? We're bringing jobs and dollars into West Michigan. Now imagine, as I do, 10 more companies, startup companies with a new idea, a new widget. How about 100? Because I can. To try to help, we then went on and started the Muskegon Inventor Network to try to help people like us who have an idea but don't know where to go with it, don't know what to do. And we help lots of people. We have 60 members. And with, there's lots of ideas and other products that are going to be coming out soon that we have helped get there. We don't do it for anybody, but we help them. And, and we believe that there's talent and good ideas everywhere. Six members of our group then took their ideas and, and went to a meeting, a beta test for Innovation Works. It, it deals with accelerating products to the market. And I'd like to say that we were very impressed with Innovation Works. These folks, uh, uh, both the concept, the people, and the system are just outstanding, and we think they're going to be a great help for inventors in West Michigan. Two concerns. One is time. These things take time. We are really three years from the inception before we got this thing to a million pieces. The, these issues take time, and we have to understand that. And the second thing is that there should be an inventor group in every major city in West Michigan. We have. We have six, six or seven members from Grand Rapids that drive to Muskegon to, to go to ours. It's, it's not that we're that good people. It's that we're the only game in town. Come on. Let's get one of these things everywhere. They're easy to get to and easy to start. We actually started it with no money, no, no public assistance, nothing. And our members pay $40 a year. That's it. And we get them help. Well, thank you. Thank you, Orville. By the way, I forgot to welcome the other 1% of my Asian brothers and sisters here today. Thank you. I could, I'm sorry, I couldn't help. Where's my brother Matt and Robin? There you go. Anyway, um, 
Through WIRED, WIMSA has encouraged the region's intermediate school districts to partner on West Michigan Global Education Network. Here is Ron Kaler, Assistant Superintendent for Organization and Community for Kent Area Intermediate School District. Where are you, Ron? Right here. I see you. Hey. Good seeing you again. Good to see you. And uh, it's great to be here today and uh, great to, to talk to you about the work that we're doing with all of you. The Intermediate School District, I've got it on. Hold up. There? Okay. It's technology. <laughs> it's great to be here with all of you today. Just quickly, an intermediate school district is an education service agency that serves all of the schools within its region. Kent serves 23 in Kent and Barrie counties. Our six partners in the global education and science and technology, engineering and math initiative serve all of the schools within the seven county region that makes up the wired area. For Orville and all of the other businesses here, talent is your oxygen. Without talent, you can't grow, you can't create, we can't compete. You know, we feel as though we've helped establish a baseline of talent through our work with the National Career Readiness Certificate in identifying and making sure that young people have the basic skills for employment and the ability then to identify what skills do they need for employment that will sustain a family and employment that achieves the technical level of and, and technology and technicians that you need to make your companies grow and prosper. But that's the baseline. Beyond that is higher level attainment and achievement that will really give us the talent Orville and his friends need to succeed, that all of you need to succeed. The Science, Technology, and Engineering Math Initiative, the Global Economy Initiative that we're working on we believe will help us increase the level of achievement throughout our region by building capacity of our teachers, by identifying the global and national indicators and measures of success that our students need to achieve, and by building capacity in our students so that they can aspire to jobs at places like the Van Andel Institute where my friend Marsha Bishop is an educational director and we're working with them as well. And so the important thing about the dollars that Wired has given us is that it's giving us the opportunity to do some of this work. But more importantly than the dollars is the opportunity to create the partnerships that we see here today the opportunity to achieve a common understanding of what our goals are and to work together with you to accomplish them as opposed to the finger pointing and the scapegoating that has gone on in the past or that we see in, elsewhere in our economy and elsewhere in the nation. That's the real joy of this work. That's the real power of the work that we're doing today. And on behalf of all of the intermediate school districts that make up the Wired region, thank you for the opportunity to work together with you collaboratively. The $15 million Wired grant from the U.S. Department of Labor has had a real impact on workforce innovation in West Michigan. But what comes next for Wired? Here's Jim Fisher, president of Padno Shoreline Recycling and a Wired Policy Council member. Jim, where are you? Good afternoon, everybody. It's just booming out here. I'm here to tell you about an exciting new initiative. It's called Talent 2025. View my remarks this afternoon as giving you a sneak peek. It's like a trailer before a movie that we're going to call Talent 2025. The last three years, I've worked with several outstanding leaders in West Michigan on the Wired Policy Council. But Wired is coming to an end next year. We've had several accomplishments, and several of the workforce initiatives that have been funded by Wired have demonstrated it's possible to transform parts of the talent development system here in West Michigan. 
and some exciting practices are being funded by local philanthropy and state funds. So we know it's possible to build on these innovations. So the next step that's been outlined by several of us from the Wired Policy Council, including Fred Keller from Cascade Engineering and Milt Rohr from the Fry Foundation, along with Greg Northrup, Phil Rios from Wired, and two consultants, is called Talent 2025. What we've concluded is that it's time for businesses, business leadership, to take the lead in launching a multi-decade regional leadership initiative to drive West Michigan's economic prosperity through exemplary performance in our talent systems for people of all ages in the region. We're calling it Talent 2025. I want you to pause for a minute and think about the vision that we've created for Talent 2025. It's pretty exciting and it moves and inspires me. In 17 years, think forward to the year 2025, the quality of our regional talent pool is driving a new wave of economic prosperity. Employers are locating and staying in West Michigan because of the highly skilled talent pool. And West Michigan is credibly recognized nationally and internationally for its integrated regional talent systems, including all levels of the formal education system and the many informal systems that exist in companies and families and communities. When we talk about a regional talent development system, let's just pause for a moment and think about the different pieces of it. It includes childhood development. A buzzword today is pre-14 or P-14. We have to look all the way back. We have to go all the way back to the beginning, to kids that are, that are getting ready to even come to school. We have to think about the whole K-12 system. We've got to not just think about four-year college graduates. We've got to focus on the two-year programs. And we've got to look forward to the fact that we've got people all through the pipeline of workforce development that are going to need further education and training. And baby boomers are going to be working longer. By the year 2025, it's not going to be unusual for people in their 80s and perhaps even their 90s to be part of the workforce. That whole workforce in 2025 needs to be at world-class, globally competitive levels. So it will be our goal to outline what we're going to do to make sure that we bridge the gap between where we baseline ourselves in 2008 and get to in 2025. We'll be taking on the task force for the next probably six to eight months to determine whether we're going to be able to launch 20, Talent 2025 at the beginning of 2009. Approximately 15 business leaders will be convened beginning in June to begin that process. I'll look forward to further updates with you, and by this time next year, we hope it's rolling. Thank you. Jim, am I doing all right? He's looking very tanned. Get the George Hamilton look going. And lastly, Ryan Cotton from the West Michigan Strategic Alliance Board of Directors has an announcement. Where are you, Ryan? Right here. I Ryan. don't look like Ryan. I'm Ryan Cotton, uh, manager of the village of Spring Lake. Actually, I'm Nancy Crandall. I'm the former mayor of the city of Norton Shores. I assume Ryan is in Spring Lake working hard because he didn't make it here yet. Um, the announcement is that the West Michigan Strategic Alliance Board of Directors has adopted working smart growth principles. If you recall in our initial publication, one of our priorities was a Tri-Cities growth strategy. And able to make that growth strategy sustainable, we really have to look at how we grow, where we grow, and making sure we're growing in a smart way. So Ryan and I, along with Jim Buck, Mayor of Granville, have been working with a number of organizations to develop smart growth principles and then to develop next steps for getting those adopted throughout the region. We will be working with the regional metropolitan planning organizations, the counties, cities, township governments, 
to adopt and, more importantly, to use these smart growth principles so that we may guide their growth and development of the region, the placement of infrastructure, and to ensure that West Michigan is smart with overall growth. Thank you, Nancy. These smart growth principles work hand in hand with efforts of our green infrastructure initiatives to ensure West Michigan remains a desirable location for attracting talent. Now, what you've seen here today is really a sampling of the work being done by the uh, strategic, strategic Alliance with the help of many, many volunteers. We're proud to say that we aren't doing it all. There are unprecedented levels of cooperation and collaboration going on in our region, and we should all be very proud. Collaboration is happening all over the place. Businesses are working together to enhance supplier networks and advance sustainability principles. Local units of government are working together to share services or coordinate planning. Our economic development organizations are using the strengths of the region to court world-class companies. Groups like Disability Advocates and the Regional Transit Study Group are approaching our transportation issues from a regional perspective. The West Michigan Chamber Coalition is putting a major focus on the issue of diversity in our region. These are not initiatives under the control of West Michigan Strategic Alliance. They are people like you taking a larger perspective to work for the good of the region, and it truly does add up. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Judy Stark. I'm the Dean in the School of Workforce Development at Grand Rapids Community College, stepping in for our president, Dr. Juan Oliveras, who sends his greetings but was unable to join us today. Um, for any of you who are familiar with the American College testing process or who maybe have never had the pressure, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean the pleasure of taking the test, you know, the ACT assessment measures high school students' general educational development and their ability to complete college-level coursework in four areas, English, math, reading, and science. And, you know, as an educator at GRCC, I really want to acknowledge how we use the ACT test to use to place students appropriately in coursework um, along with their high school diploma. Without that, we, it would be much more difficult. So that really has helped us get the students in the appropriate um, college-level courses. Since 1988, Dr. Dick Ferguson has held the top post at ACT, growing the organization from 100 employees and one test to more than 1,400 employees and 100-plus programs and services. Throughout his career, Dr. Ferguson has written on a broad cross-section of education and training issues. He has served on numerous advisory boards um, and on education and testing and is a frequent speaker at educational meetings in the U.S. and abroad. Dr. Ferguson earned a B.S. in mathematics from Indiana University and an M.A. in mathematics from Western Michigan University. He also earned a Ph.D. in educational research and statistics from the University of Pittsburgh in 1969 and then subsequently was honored from the University of Pittsburgh from the, um, as a Distinguished Alumnus Award, the School of Education, and then the University's Distinguished Alumni Fellows Award in 1997. He also was awarded an honorary doctoral degree from Iowa Wesleyan University in 2004. Under his leadership, ACT has a broad range of assessments across the educational continuum and a growing number of assessment models for workforce and economic development, including one that this room has heard a lot about, Work Keys Tests for the National Career Readiness Certificate. ACT is now taking the same model and approach for creating a common measure for secondary to higher education path to now create a common definition and measure of skill for those who want to pursue secondary education to the workforce path. This goes beyond that high school diploma where no two educations are alike and it demonstrates the types of skills that employers say that they want and need to measure. It's this innovative approach that can really drive the talent for our local, regional, state, and national economy. An expert in education and learning, 
Dr. Ferguson is here to share those insights with us and to show how it is investment in talent that drives prosperity. As you look at our state of the region, talent should be our top priority. This must be our investment for the region. Please, let's welcome him today, Dr. Dick Ferguson. Thank you very much, Judy, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, it actually bettered one I had uh, a couple of weeks ago, a much shorter one where the uh, in the individual introducing me observed that uh, he's a doctor, but he can't help you. So that was rather a uh, sobering opening, and uh, I much prefer the one that Judy shared this morning. Really is a great pleasure for me to be here, and I'm most appreciative of the West Michigan Strategic Alliance for inviting me. Uh, this is one of several occasions that I've had over the last uh, couple of years to visit in Michigan and to join with so many of you who have a great concern for ultimately the well-being of the region, the state, and, and the nation. Uh, I've spent a lot of time here, and much of that time has been with uh, uh, Bill Guest, who is seated over here, and Rachel uh, Jungblatt, both of who have been very, very instrumental in the Wired project. I think you know that ACT has been much involved in as well. And I just want to say how much we appreciate their good efforts uh, over the last years and which are continuing. I know they work very, very hard for all of you and for, for the region. You know, the focus of the meeting today is on talent and talent driving prosperity. It really is a time in which that message uh, has never been uh, in need of being uh, pronounced more loudly and with more conviction than any time in my memory. Unfortunately, though, prosperity really isn't a term that can be easily applied to the U.S. economy. I think I can repeat a number of things that we're all, all too aware of. Uh, the advent, potentially, of a recession. You can argue it one way or another. I think we have a recession that is underway. We hope it will be a mild one. Unemployment rates, we know, are rising. And we see have, uh, the job losses have hit a, a five-year all-time high in the last year. The U.S. dollar certainly is challenged everywhere. The housing market is in something of a shambles. We're seeing sluggish economic growth right now. And we have, in some respects, a government now that is in its waning months and probably will have limited influence to change much of anything in those months. So we, we face an uphill battle. That's not a message that I particularly enjoy conveying, but it is one that simply realistically states the case. I believe that here in West Michigan, and the evidence is just so very strong, that in fact, that even though we confront those obstacles and others that we could identify, you are very, very well positioned with visionary leadership, individuals who are investing energy and effort to essentially overcome those obstacles. And I'm here to tell you that I, for one, am very impressed as I travel all around the country. I don't believe I can find a single region or area where uh, the effort is as aggressive, as assertive, and as well-focused as it is here in West Michigan. So I'm here to compliment you on that. I'd like to do a few things today with the few minutes that I have with you. Uh, one of those is I would like to share some information in support of the notion that talent does drive prosperity. And in fact, to acknowledge the efforts, as I will comment a little bit further on uh, here in West Michigan, that ACT has been essentially identified with as well. First, I want to offer some comments about why I believe that skills, talent, skills, are the key to prosperity for individuals, for businesses, for communities, and for, frankly, states and nations. Second, I want to offer a few observations that are based on some of ACT's data about the need for skills. Third, I'll provide a brief description of the work key system. You've heard a bit about that, but just enough to essentially make the point with some data that I'll follow up with. And then finally, I want to comment a little bit more on the work here in Michigan and our commitment to working side by side with you in the months and the years ahead. First of all, what case can be made for the fact that skills are a key to prosperity? One of the things that we clearly know is that skills today are not only portable, they are increasingly exportable. 
And the evidence of growth in so many other economies around the world simply should underscore for us that there are lots of folks who believe that skills are very important to prosperity and actually are living that experience. We can't afford as a nation to not adopt that same point of view. Secondly, the skills that are needed for the jobs around the world, here in the U.S. certainly, but around the world, are changing, and we do need to be in step with those changes. And we say those words fairly easily. We don't necessarily act on them nearly as easily. Third, skills can be door openers, or they can be door closers for any number of groups. For the emerging workforce, skills affect the chance for those individuals who are entering the workforce to get their dream job. The incumbent workforce, which we cannot overlook, employees who seek to climb the, the skills ladder, the job ladder, better themselves. When they don't have the skills, certainly don't have those opportunities, and in many cases require others to kind of pick up the slack when the skills are missing in the workplace. Businesses, certainly skills affect the bottom line. So many of you here recognize that uh, very, very directly and very, very easily. The lack of skills lead to waste, to low productivity, to turnover, and of course the presence of those can absolutely flip those, let those terms around in the opposite and in a more positive direction. Cities, regions, and states obviously are paying the price for where skills are lacking and where no energy is being committed to altering that situation. According to Area Development Magazine, and some of you I think have seen that or access to it, about 85% of the nation's executives have ranked availability of skilled talent or skilled labor pool as highly important when considering site selection. And one recent example of that I can give you that we can directly relate to at ACT is with Toyota in your neighboring state of Indiana. There, they needed to increase production of the Camry, one of their best-selling automobiles, as you know, and the company chose to locate a $230 million facility in Lafayette, Indiana, after receiving data data from ACT's workforce system, our work key system, about the skills of more than 6,000 local residents in that area. There was a case of where the local community was using the data to illustrate, to demonstrate, and underscore the fact that we have the individuals with the skill levels that are needed for the jobs. That's a powerful argument if you as a region are looking to attract additional business, or in fact, for those who have businesses here to grow them further, that the skills that are needed are present. Now, I simply want to underscore again, you're on the track to do that, and I think do that uh, in spades in the future. Now, obviously, all the good consequences that follow on that are known to you, and that is when we bring higher paying jobs, jobs that do require the higher skills, they also pay off in more taxes and all the other things that essentially benefit the entire region. Very critical, very important. I think that the skill sets clearly do drive prosperity for that whole cross-section, individuals, employers, businesses, the state, uh, everybody benefits. I want to give you one other simple example of that uh, in my own uh, special sphere of uh, experience, which is the uh, technology corridor where ACT is located in Iowa City, uh, which connects with Cedar Rapids. Just a year ago, in that particular region, uh, we combined with the Skills Advantage Network there, and 48 employers agreed to randomly select a sample of their employees who would then be asked to take the work keys battery and earn a certificate, a National Career Readiness Certificate. Uh, all 48 of the companies agreed, randomly selected uh, employees, and happily got virtually all of them to agree to sit for a test. I'm not so sure if we asked all of you to do that this afternoon, you would be ready and willing. Uh, that's something I would hesitate on, frankly, myself. But the bottom line is, the result of that was, the, uh, that the regional effort was able to demonstrate what the entire, a cross-section of the entire workforce looks like in that corridor relative to the skill sets that the individuals have there. That's now a document that is being used in a very, very polished fashion to recruit additional firms to the region. 
Now, I point this out only to say that a lot of these things are happening in parts of the country that essentially recognize and realize that skills are the difference. They will make the difference in so many different ways. And you are well on your way here in West Michigan in a path, I think, that really is unique in the nation on the scale and the manner of engaging so many different elements of the, the region in that effort that uh, you deserve clearly a big, big set of applause for all that good effort. Let me now comment also on some of the national information that we think might be of interest to you in this whole area, just very, very briefly. With the advancements in technology that we're seeing in the, work of, uh, the world of work today, and we heard about some of those in the presentations just a few moments ago, jobs are clearly becoming more complex, and they are requiring workers to possess greater skills. So some will argue that, but the reality is it's just hard to, to combat the facts when one really gets down to the brass tacks with what are the skills that jobs require. Our own Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Federal Bureau, says that more than 75% of the current workforce will require more training during the course of their work life. No great surprise to most of us in that area. The Department of Labor predicts that in the near future, 80% of all jobs will require some level of education beyond high school. In a recent study by the conference board, which is a workforce research organization, reported that most young people entering the workforce currently are lacking some of the skills that most employers are looking for. Further, that 28% of businesses will reduce the selection of any individual who has only a high school diploma in the near future. And employers are already moving, raising the, the, the standard, as it were, for minimum uh, skill sets that are essentially available for them to hire. And of course, the reason has much to do with uh, productivity and their ability to compete and do their work effectively. So unless we're willing to make an effort at leaving no worker behind, no young person behind who looks to enter the workforce with the right skills, we're going to pay the price for that in the future. And I do know that we uh, are, as an organization, we know that so many of you here in the West Region area are committed to, in fact, making that investment and that effort, and we're seeing that in the day-to-day -day work that you are about. ACT does have a fair amount of information about talent and about skills. I think many of you know that. Uh, I might, and I always do this in an audience of this size, I can't resist. How many of you would have had that wonderful experience of taking the ACT at some point in time in your life? Okay. As I've noted earlier, we still have your scores. Uh, we were founded in 1959, and every single one of your scores is still available. So you do want to be good. Uh, bottom line there, though, is that those are data that we are able to draw on and look at, you know, historical patterns over time. So we have really great insights into not only what were the uh, skills that individuals were able to demonstrate at the time they took the ACT, but what happened in many cases after. Because colleges provide us the data in terms of how the students performed when they got there, because that helps us to use the assessments better for placing students in the right courses and the like. And so we have a lot of information that does suggest to us what I think many of you already know, and that is that we, we do have a bit of a skills gap right now that is related not only to individuals who aren't going on to college, but those who are. Now, a couple of comments that I think sometimes surprise individuals. We lose one million students a year in our schools. One million students a year drop out of our schools, do not graduate from, or do not stay in school to graduate from high school. Add that up over the last five years, that's five million young people who are out there who are either in the workforce or not, maybe in trouble or whatever the case may be, certainly not where we would like to see them in terms of their skill sets. Now, that's not to mention many others who come from a variety of different backgrounds and experiences where they've not had the opportunity or have not pursued the opportunities for acquiring those skill sets they'll need for today's jobs. That's a pretty significant issue that we have to contend with as a nation. 
I think most of you know that here in Michigan that uh, ACT a couple of years ago was integrated into the MME, the National, the uh, Michigan Merit Exam, and I think good data are coming from that uh, process that the uh, Department of Education looks to essentially use to affect decisions that will ultimately, I think, benefit students and parents and the schools themselves. That, of course, depends upon good use of the data and acting on the information that is there. But we have at ACT a great deal of data that tell us about uh, our readiness as a nation uh, with nearly two and a half million students taking the ACT each year. It's a quite rich database to speak to the skill sets that students have, uh, as Judy mentioned, in math and reading and science and English. We can operate on those data, and we choose to do that. One of the things that I take note of, as Judy said, and it, it really kind of segues us into the thing that brings us together here today, which is a little bit further comment on the workforce development area and the National Career Readiness Certificate that uh, is essentially being uh, accepted and adopted here in West Michigan. And, and that is that ACT's roots as an organization, and we are a not-for-profit organization, so our mission is really how do we help people achieve a level of success, a next level of success in education or in work. But the, the, the ACT organization itself was founded in a day and age in which most of the states throughout the Midwest, the South, and much of the country had their own college admission program. It was a separate exam that each of them did on their own with a lot of obstacles that were part of that experience. Uh, individual students couldn't move from one state to another easily. That was a, a challenge when that was occurring. In many cases, the states didn't really have the toolkits or the skills to, to build the assessments and so forth, let alone deliver them in an effective manner. And the bottom line is we had a whole mixture of standards that were very difficult for anyone to understand. And it was in that sort of context that ACT came to exist, where those states were convinced, persuaded at one point in time, back in the late 1950s, that we would benefit as a group of states if, in fact, we were to unite and have a single assessment, a college admission test, and thus the American College Testing Program was founded in 1959. And over the years, uh, we have seen that uh, program certainly grow from the perspective of how do we essentially get information about that people can act on that will bring about change. Uh, you know, I offer this little comment in that regard because it ties into our concern here today, all of our concern about the workforce of tomorrow. In fact, what is occurring and what is moving, the students moving through our school are the pipeline for the workforce of tomorrow. Forget for the moment, if we dare, even the million who are dropping out, what about the one or two million who are graduating but in many cases are not there with the skills they need for the workplace setting? Of the roughly two and a half million students who took the ACT last year, uh, suggesting for the most part that they were looking at college or some next level of education or training, barely 50% of them had taken, are taking math and science in their junior and senior year of high school. Now that immediately limits their opportunities for so many of the jobs and so many of the uh, opportunities that will exist out there in the years ahead. Now that is something we can deal with. About, deal with. Uh, it's a simple message. If we have that uh, uh, effort, if we have some changes in that area, we can affect what that pipeline for the workforce will look like tomorrow. And we recognize it's not all that simple. There are a lot of complications behind that message, but the reality is if students don't take math, they're not going to have the math skills. If they don't take science, they're not going to have the science skills. And making those up later is a much, much bigger challenge for us all than essentially attending to it right out of the gate. So. We're concerned at ACT with the pipeline and affecting getting young people moving through it with the skills they need so that in the future they are well positioned for success in education and work. But we also recognize, and that is what brought us to the uh, topic that brings me uh, to speak to you again today, and that is the work key system that we began creating in the late 1980s. We came to recognize that in fact, about a half of the students at the time in the nation were not looking to go on to a four-year college, and many of them not to a two-year college either. 
also aware that nearly a half of those who did go on to college would not complete college. It's a little better than that today, but not a whole lot better. And so these are individuals who, for the most part, uh, unless they will be a burden on our community and our economy, will be entering the workforce. And they will be entering with or without the skills that they need for the jobs that exist. And we recognize that at the time we were not really attending organizationally to that issue at all. And we saw in many respects the same issues and the same challenges in the workplace setting that we observed many, many, many years before on the college front. And that was too many mixed messages being communicated and conveyed uh, to those who were expected to find solutions and remedies. Remedies being how do we help individuals get the skill sets that are needed so that they can and will succeed in, in their workplace setting. That really led us to get together with literally hundreds of employers in many, many states around the country to talk to them about, you know, they were very critical in many cases of uh, the workforces that they were experiencing, in some cases those coming out of our schools, in other cases not. But the bottom line being somehow we just don't have the people with the skills we need for our jobs with all the obvious consequences. We brought educators and employers literally by the hundreds together over a four to five year period, uh, spending a lot of time listening to what the issues were and concluding in the final analysis that uh, educators and employers would, would perpetually talk past each other. Does that sound familiar at all? Uh, and not in maliciously, just a different language in, in many cases that uh, simply where the connection was very, very hard to make. That led us to believe what we needed to do is to create a new language, a new language that both parties would learn over time. And it would be a skills-based language, a language that says here are skills that individuals need to learn and we'll define what those are and we'll define them in this case in the context of a workplace. So we spent, as I mentioned, years working with employers to have them help us identify the essentially skill areas that most of the nation's jobs require. And I refer to the foundational skills, not the very job-specific ones, but to foundational skills which, if they are not present, it is highly unlikely the individual will acquire the higher or job-specific skills. It is highly unlikely they will be individuals who will be learning well on the job or continuing to learn well on the job. So employers identified for us roughly eight different skill areas. I'm not going to list all of them now, but give you examples. Reading for information, applied technology, applied math, locating information, and so on. And they defined for us what those skills were and all the different levels of skills under each of those areas. And thus came the work key system that was derived really from a workplace orientation. And so uh, our concept then was to say, well, now how do we make a connection with the work key system that would be like what we have been able to do with the college readiness area? skills that students are going to need to be ready for that freshman math class, that freshman English class and so forth. How do we make that connection with the workplace? The easy answer for that, but not so easily implemented, was to create a job profiling system, which employers would essentially uh, use in one fashion or another, which is profile their jobs as to the level of those work key skills the job requires. And thus we come up with a profile for a job like computer programmer, where that is a job that requires a level five of reading for information, a level six of applied mathematics, a level five or six of uh, locating information, and so on, where basically we were able to make that connection that says an individual who has skills at those levels will be someone who is essentially prepared for that computer programmer job at the level of uh, readiness in those foundational skill areas. Now we proceeded to do that and ultimately have over the last 10 years or so now had by companies over nearly 14,000 now of the nation's jobs have been profiled. 
So you can almost find roughly two-thirds of the nation's jobs. We have a profile for that is tied to work keys, and it comes out of a significant effort that an employer has committed to to do a task analysis of that job which they hold. Now, the strength of that is to the individual who is looking for a job, a particular job, we can be straightforward, honest, upfront with them regarding what are the skills that that job is going to require. We can assess and find out whether that individual has that skill, that set of skills, and we can do a skills gap analysis if that is, in fact, what occurs, and then we can do something about it. We can essentially fill that gap with the instruction that will focus on where that skill is lacking and how we can move that skill forward. That is what we are seeing occurring here in West Michigan that is so encouraging for us. The embracing of the notion that we can connect individuals to the skills that jobs require, individuals with the jobs that are there, employers with individuals who have the skills that are needed, and most important of all, that where there is a skills gap or there is a lack, we can do something about it. Because I can assure you, we know that for a fact, that here in West Michigan, here in all of Michigan, here in any state in the nation, we have large numbers of individuals who, without some effective intervention are not ready for the jobs that we see in the workplace. I know there are jobs in Michigan that are going unfilled today because we do not have the individuals with the skills for those jobs. And you're not unique, but it's definitely true here. Our message is we can do something about it, but we're not going to do something about it if every one of us as employers, as educators, sort of make up our own solution and move forward. We need to have an organizer for that. That is our message at, at ACT, which says there are these common skills. We need a common measurement, and we need a vehicle for connecting because they're not all that different in one part of the country from the other. And we can essentially tie to a specific job in a specific company in a specific employment setting. And that is what we need to do if, in fact, we're going to affect change of the kind that we all, I think, uh, believe is necessary if we're going to see the prosperity uh, that we would like to see and if we're going to sustain it in the future. By the way, one of the things that we've came to come to recognize very early on, and this was a message we heard loud and clear from so many of the employers we have been working with, is the skills are fine. I'll call them the hard skills, like those that I described a bit later. But one of our big issues as an employer is the, quote, soft skills or personal skills. Uh, do individuals who I employ understand they need to behave in certain ways? They need to show up at work on time. They need to do all the various things that essentially are part of a productive work environment. And that did lead us to create, with, again, significant input from the employers that we work with, a whole array of personal skills assessment called we, we name them performance, which have to do with personal attitudes and so forth that the individual brings to a job. Does that make a difference? I, I think it does. I think it does in a big way. If people don't have a good attitude about their work, they're not likely to be very productive in it. The talent uh, dimension of it, which has to do with the essentially the, the, the uh, extent to which the individual has the discipline, the sociability, all the attributes that essentially will make them work well in a team or workplace setting, and then, then fit and the, the extent to which their interests match up with their uh, job opportunity. Uh, you know, I look at a group like this and I think uh, that uh, you're all terribly bright, I'm sure of it. You're here today, so that is a signal that that is the case. Probably you could be almost anything you wanted to be if we were talking about your academic skills and the capabilities that you uh, essentially have acquired over, over your lifetime. That does not mean you would be happy in anything that you might choose. And one of the things that we have introduced at ACT with the MME and obviously with the work keys capability as well is the measurement of interest in connecting that to ability and tying that to jobs as well. Because we want the whole person, we want the whole connection there for a successful experience and a successful work experience for individuals. 
One of the things that ha has happened over the last few years, and which brings us to the National Career Readiness Certificate uh, concept, which I'd like to speak to just very briefly today, and why it is so important, and why we are so thrilled that, in fact, here in West Michigan, you are really leading in this on a national level. And that is that uh, though we think that the work key system that we have designed is just a wonderful tool and uh, we understand it inside and out at ACT, we also understand that it's somewhat complex sometimes for people uh, to grasp, to make the connection between the assessment and the job profiling and the training and all of the connections. And one of the things that has been occurring then across the country is an awareness that if we're going to have an impact as a region, as a state, as a nation on this huge issue we have that we call workforce readiness. And it is a huge issue, a growing one, which I might add is being tackled very brilliantly by many other countries and doing, and they're doing it in a way that essentially will essentially leave us behind if we don't get uh, our own act together as it were. And, and in that regard, the, the issue here has to do with, again, getting a common effort underway and an understanding that, in fact, uh, we can have a common measure and ruler that employers can use uniquely to their, their own case. But what is important is that we have a common ruler. If we were uh, carpenters and every one of us made up our own ruler and we were building homes, we would have a real serious problem. I don't know why we can't understand that if we don't do something of that same ilk when we are looking at how we measure the skills of the workplace, the ability to do that and create a system that then allows the, the builder, as it were, the workforce developer to use that same tool, but to, in varying degrees as a function of the job. But having created that capability, we now have an ability to get a common message to our educators. We have a, uh, a common ability to get a message to our trainers, to everybody who's involved in this that says we'll put our energy behind building those skill sets because if we built that foundation and that base, great many things follow, including the opportunity for you know, more learning, more skills to, to occur for those to, to develop over time. So what has occurred is we recognize that there are actually of the eight work key skills that employers identified of the nearly 14,000 jobs we profiled. And again, I underscore this is probably the most intensive analysis of and description of what a job requires in the way of skills that I think has been done in the nation. Uh, ACT, with its database, has far more information about what the nation's jobs require than the U.S. Department of Labor has, by far because of the profiling that has been done with all these jobs uh, by employers. But what we, what we learned was there are three of those skill areas for work keys that are just, they're very present in every job. And one of the three surprised us when we got into it. But that is reading for information. Guess what? Most jobs require some level of reading, don't they? Applied math. A lot of people don't see math as necessarily apparent in every job. Well, it's there, I assure you, to some level. Not always to the highest level, but to some level. And the one that surprised us was locating information. The ability for an individual to take information that is given to them, maybe in a chart or maybe in some form, extract from it what they need and then act on it. Think of that in a workplace setting where you're exposed to a great deal of information and you have to solicit from it those pieces that will allow you to do your job to essentially perform well. Those are the three that appear in those 14,000 profiles that we have done in very prominent ways. As a result of that, we have created and do that in cooperation now with uh, many, many, many states and many regions, this one being the prime from our point of view, uh, the National Career Readiness Certificate. If you are an individual, whether you're a high school student, uh, a young adult, uh, an older adult, however you want to frame that, the system is skills-based. It doesn't care about age. It doesn't care about your grade in school or your grade level. It's the skills that our nation's jobs require. But if you are able to perform at level three in all three of those assessments, 
applied mathematics, reading for information and locating information, you earn a bronze National Career Readiness Certificate. And that says you're ready for about 35% of those 14,000 jobs. Would you expect, by the way, with a bronze certificate that you would be necessarily getting a high-paying job? Probably not, and I'll give you some illustration of that in a moment. The silver certificate, all level fours, which essentially says you're ready for about 65 to 70 percent of those 14,000 jobs, and the gold, you're ready for about 90 percent of them. As an employer, you can look them up and see the profile for your jobs if the job has been profiled. So the matching there is very strong. But what it provides is a powerful tool for a region, for example, looking at the jobs in the region and the skill sets that those jobs require to match that up to what are the skills of that workforce. And where they are lacking, how do we build that skill set? We can't be satisfied with leaving people behind, leaving them where they, in fact, don't have the skills, and we're not doing anything to change that. And that's what I think the Wired Project, that is what the Strategic Alliance and the projects and all the efforts here are all about. How do we move people up? How do we improve, enhance that workforce? Let me give you a little bit of data here. By the way, uh, ACT is very big in data. We sort of adopt to that notion that in God we trust, all others bring data. Maybe some of you have heard that line before. We believe data is important to our decision making because people with opinions without data are people with opinions. Data, in fact, drive. And that's why as we look to the data that I'm sharing with you, I think it can be very, very sobering. One of the things we've done here, and we've tied this to Michigan data, or let's take the level of NRC, NCRC, National Career Readiness Certificate, bronze, silver, or gold, and what are the jobs that we have profiled that fall under the bronze, silver, or gold? In this particular case, it's the healthcare industry. So you think of healthcare jobs in the, West Mich in the Michigan uh, area, and you can see very simply what some of those jobs are and what their pay is. What do they, what do they essentially produce in the way of pay? Rather than go into detail for you with that, I think you can see what the trend line is. Let's move that up a notch to another area, and that's advanced manufacturing. We've heard a lot about that in this area, and it will be a major part of the future here, we hope. Once again, and let's move ahead to information technology, IT. One of the questions that we've been involved in some discussions with even earlier today is, you know, what, what's sort of the target we ought to have for West Michigan here relative to what we would be aspiring to for the individuals in the workforce here? Uh, I'm not sure we aspire to the bronze. Now, we may be there, but we probably want to aspire beyond that. Now, there will be people who will be at the bronze. By the way, there are people who are below the, the bronze. Uh, here in the region and, and, and in the country everywhere. We know that from our, from our assessment. One of the things that's very important about the NCRC and what you all have been embracing here, so many of you have, is that it is a developmental system. Individuals who aren't even at the bronze level, who are at the bronze level or the silver level, don't have to remain there. We can show you what the skills are that are lacking that will move you from that one level to the next level, thereby positioning you at least for readiness for further education, training, or whatever for that next level of job that one might like to have. So the system is for young people coming out of our schools to be sure. It is for people who are entering the workforce for the first time, people who are in the workforce. But the issue and the key here is being upfront and clear with individuals as to what it is that we are talking about when we speak to the skills that are needed for jobs. So often those have been hidden. By the way, I think there's one more slide with the hospitality industry, which is, I think, significant uh, throughout the state here. And again, you get the same picture. One more slide, which is on a national level, We've done the same thing with the 14,000 or so jobs and put them into the bronze, silver, and gold, and you're looking at the average salaries as a function of where you are as an individual with those skills. So do skills translate to prosperity? You don't have them, 
you're not going to get the prosperity. If you have them, you have a good shot at, in fact, seeing prosperity as an individual, as a region, as a state, and in our case, as a, as a nation. Now, Michigan really is leading the way in terms of the work key system and with, I think, the embrace of the National Career Readiness Certificate. And it is an economic issue. I would submit on a national level, and I often say this, it's a national security issue. Our failure as a nation to attend to the issue of skills development and so forth is a national security issue because our economy will not sustain itself over time. It will falter, and a lot goes when that happens. So it is in our interest as a nation to commit to the uh, very things that we are all very concerned about uh, as a group here, and I think increasingly as a nation. I think many of you know that uh, for the last uh, year or two now that the MME has included two of the three uh, work keys assessments that permit a young person in our high school to earn a national career readiness uh, certificate before they leave. That, by the way, enables that individual to go to an ACT website and whether it's an adult or that student, and create their own little site with their name and their ID on it, which they totally control and have populated on that site with their name. In fact, all of you could do it if you like. Uh, just complete the assessments, and we will create a, no doubt, a gold certificate for each of you. Uh, you control it, and you have an ID, and if you're applying for a job or a promotion, you just give that employer that ID, and they can go online and go to the ACT site electronically, look at your certificate, and verify you have the skills that the job requires. It's a tool for communicating and effectively allowing and helping employers and individuals connect in a way that essentially says, we understand that skills, in fact, are the core issue here for us. Have them, we can do a lot of things together. Don't have them, we are going to be troubled in the future. Well, the West Michigan Wired Initiative, I think, you know, has really used the $15 million grant that it had in an exceptional way. I know we have over 9,000 individuals in the Grand Rapids uh, School District, uh, Ron spoke to a little earlier, who last year did earn a career readiness, a national career readiness certificate. That's terrific, you know. Uh, and by the way, we want to make clear, we're not looking to replace the high school diploma. The high school diploma has a currency that is important in its own right. But the Work Keys National Career Readiness Certificate adds another dimension to that that essentially enriches it from everybody's point of view. We think the student, the employer, and others as well. But over 9,000 students last year got, along with their high school diploma, in a couple of the districts here in this region, a National Career Readiness Certificate which essentially establishes their skill sets in these areas. We have more than 200 area companies right now, many of you no doubt in the room here today, who are identifying with the National Career Readiness Certificate. And we know that there are more than 1,400 jobs in this region that essentially are uh, in need of people with the skills who we have able to connect the National Career Readiness System with. More than 15,000 certificates have been issued in the region here uh, in just in the, the last short time. And as you know, that there is now recommendations afoot to say, can we expand this on a, on a broader level? And we hope to be a part of that with you because we understand as well, I think, as anyone who doesn't live here what the issues are relative to the importance of a, a solid and capable workforce. You've got essentially, what's the population of the state? Around 12 million, is it? 10? You've got 10 million reasons then for why you want to be committed to this particular issue over the long term. You've got a talent pool here that is, I think, uh, certainly uh, highly capable, but you also have a lot of individuals who will benefit by a system of the type and a commitment to uh, a system like the one that we are describing. And by the way, I always understand uh, in a case like this when I'm speaking to a group like this, that this is tied to an ACT program, and therefore there's a little bit of sort of the notion of it being a self-serving message that I am giving. I acknowledge that right out of the gate, and, and you're quite right, it is. 
but by the same token, do understand again that the mission that we have as a not-for-profit organization and all the resources that we have go back into what we are doing really is predicated on the assumption that what we must do as a not-for-profit, we have the obligation to be investing our resources and our energies in those things that are going to better the areas, the people that we essentially are working with and serving. And that really is what ACT is all about. By the way, one of the things that I want to illustrate, and I'm, I'm about to wrap up here, I know time is quickly passing, uh, with a personal story. And, and we have one here in the area that I thought would be useful to know. And uh, it's a Benton Harbor resident. Her name's Sherry Gibson. I don't know if any of you would know Sherry, but she has a little story I'm gonna, gonna tell. Sherry was laid off from her job some time ago as an inspector at Whirlpool. She did find her employment benefits running out. Sure, she wasn't alone in that. To improve her career options and choices, Sherry did take the work case system through Michigan Works. She scored higher than maybe she even thought she would, especially on the locating information and applied math section of the assessments. Her test scores landed her a job as a customer service representative at a ground transportation company. So she attained a completely different type of job in a completely different type of industry than she had been working in because her work keys documented her transferable skills from one area to the other. And we can repeat that story over and over again in many places around the country. The skills are the driver. Jobs have a lot of the skills in common. Other things can be learned on the job, but there are those foundational skills that create the opportunity for that, for that change. Well, concluding, I know that Michigan's greatest resource is its people, its talent. And that source we do not want to see anywhere uh, underdeveloped and underutilized. And that is what motivates us to be here with you today and to be a partner with West Michigan uh, as we look to the future and the goals that have been set for how we take the workforce of today and move it to a next level. My message, you know, today is that uh, there, there really are no more prizes for predicting rain. We can do that. It's now time to build arcs. And from our perspective, you're building arcs here, and we wish to be a part of that, look to be working with you in the years ahead, because this is a long-term commitment that we face and that we need to make. But doing it all together, working together in a teeming way, we are confident that great things can happen and will happen here in the coming years. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Dick. All right. Uh, based on what you've seen so far, I uh, hope you understand that we're about data, we're about collaborations, <clears throat> and we're about action. Uh, my part of the action is to help get us uh, reasonably close to schedule uh, so that we can conclude the event uh, reasonably on time. I talked to you about uh, educational attainment. Waiting for the slide to come up. I talked to you earlier about educational attainment. There we go. Um, the data this year would suggest that our educational attainment level is at 25.8%. Uh, that compares to Michigan, slightly higher, and the uh, U.S. average is slightly higher in terms of the number of people with BA degrees or higher. And you'll note from the data, no surprise, that women are smarter than men in the sense that we have more women in our region at about 29% than women, or men, I'm sorry, at 22%. Uh, and so it's a congratulations to you women out there that are showing us the way. Um, in our case, we spent a lot of time uh, looking at what we could do then based on the data. What are we going to do to deal with educational attainment? How can we actually focus on an effort that will help us in this region grow the number of, of people with BA degrees or higher? We did some benchmarking across the country. Uh, these cities are examples of those areas that have focused in on internships as a way to build their educational attainment process. 
I'm going to talk to you really quickly about an internship proposal that we have to basically increase the number of internships in our region by 3,000. We currently do about 5,000 internships per year. The hypothesis is that we target juniors at our universities or colleges for internship programs with West Michigan employers that will, will increase the number of graduates staying in our region. Now, that may mean they leave to seek other experiences, but that they come back because they understand that there's jobs here and opportunities here that will help them be successful, and we need uh, that uh, graduating class to stay. The win-win for us in this process as we've looked at it is we need to make it work for employers to reduce recruiting and training costs by bringing in diversity and new ideas. We need to make it work for students. Uh, the internships are starting to be identified as a career di differentiator. And we need to make it work for the schools to build on a strong foundation of current internship programs that are already in place at our existing universities. So the concept is to increase the number by 3,000. I always talk about scale. What can we do to, to achieve scale in our region? And 3,000 is the number that we've targeted for ourselves over the next three years. The way it would work is we'd create an internship portal, one way to access all of the students that are looking for a potential internship at all of the universities and colleges in West Michigan, as well as a partnership that I'll talk about in a minute uh, to reach out to the rest of the area of the state. One of the things that we've found in the best practices work that we've done is that smaller employers, small to mid-sized employers, could use the help of toolkit. How do I do an internship? What are my requirements and what are my obligations to the intern? How do I make the internship valuable uh, to both the intern and to me as a business? And we know a lot of the larger employers already have programs in place, but this is a way to build capability across the region. So we've developed a, a toolkit that we would work with. Our partners in this process are employers. We need to increase the number of employers that would be willing to participate in this program to achieve the goal that I've talked about. We're partnering with all of the career placement officers of all of the existing universities and colleges in our region. Uh, we've already had a series of meetings with them to talk about this process. And we're partnering with our wired friends over in southeast Michigan as well as mid-Michigan. I saw Irma uh, Zuckerberg here who's since left. The people in southeast Michigan are developing a data price process and an internship portal process that we're going to use here in West Michigan as part of our program. So we're building a partnership again that works for the state as well as works for us here in West Michigan. And think about this. We have a lot of students that go to Grand Valley, for example, that come to us from the east side of the state. And they may be looking for an internship in the summer on the east side of the state, even though they're going to school here. And can we help them create opportunities uh, that will work for them and at the same time add value for our overall process? Our implementation plan is to hire a project manager. We're forming an advisory council made up of businesses and university officials uh, to develop a communication plan and a marketing plan as to how do we roll this out with a, tent, with a launch date uh, for the fourth quarter of this year in terms of the internet portal. One access point for all employers to get into all the university options uh, is what we're talking about doing and building on top of the existing base of internships that are already in place. So. That and what I was going to do in about 15 minutes is a five-minute version of the internship program. Um, we need your feedback. I want to tell you, the work that Dick Ferguson talked about in terms of our ability to bring work keys to, to bear is, is nothing different than we can do with internships. We went from zero credentials in 2006, zero credentials, to we are issuing more credentials per capita than the 10 largest states in the United States as we speak. And they've been doing this for a number of years. We went from no companies using work keys as the basis for credentialing and hiring to 203 companies, representing 35,000 employees. And we will be at 500 companies by the end of this year. And there's no reason we can't drive the same kind of scaling process as it relates to internships in our region. And we need your help uh, in doing that. But we can provide great opportunities for our students as well as great inf information and opportunities for companies seeking new knowledge.